Today, massive container ships transport 90% of everything the world produces. At one of America's largest ports, Long Beach, California, an extraordinary feat of engineering must unfold to get the cargo off the ships and onto the nation's store shelves. But a new wave of mega-sized container ships now under construction will make that job even tougher. Can longshoremen, the dock workers who already do one of the most dangerous jobs in America, carry the extra load? Look out for the mega container ships, this time on Extreme Engineering. It's 2 p.m. on a Monday afternoon, and the Hanjin, Washington is three miles west of Long Beach, California. She sailed from South Korea 11 days ago carrying 60,000 tons of high-def TV sets, motorcycles, and fresh fish, packed inside 2,650 steel containers, each one the size of a city bus. She's average size for a container ship, almost a quarter mile long, 140 feet wide, and drawing 39 feet below the waterline. For the captain and crew, the long voyage is nearly over. But the toughest part looms ahead. They've got to park this monster at a pier inside the port of Long Beach. To do that, the captain needs expert help. He needs Vic Schisler. Okay, I'm ready to go. Don't let the business suit fool you. Vic's the guy you want at the wheel when you're trying to bring a 100,000 ton ship to berth. Many consider Vic one of the finest harbor pilots on the West Coast. It's important to have a pilot on board because the captain knows his ship very well. He knows the ocean very well. He does not know the Port of Long Beach. I bring the local knowledge that I've accumulated over the last 35 years. But to pilot the Hanjin in Washington, Vic first has to get himself on board. Good afternoon, Captain. Uh, we're departing the breakwater now, headed out for your ship. We request a heavy line for a pilot bag uh, when the boat comes alongside, please. The massive container ship is doing 12 knots, and she won't stop just for Vic, but she will at least slow down. And also, we request uh, about six or seven knot speed for boarding today, please. Boarding speed at six, seven knots. Uh, back to six, seven knots. Thank you. For Vic personally, what's coming up next will be the riskiest part of the voyage. Wearing leather dress shoes doesn't make the climbing easier. Security, all those concerned, hands in Washington approaching Queens Gate, Long Beach, inbound for berth 140, port side two, standing by channel 13, hands in Washington. But Vic can't dock this ship by himself. He needs help from the new marshal in town, the Marshal Foss. The most powerful tractor tugboat on the entire West Coast. 
just 98 feet long, she packs a screaming 6,250 horsepower in her twin engines. Captain Mark Walsh can turn her on a dime. Marshall Foss. Hey Vic, how are you? Oh, okay, that sounds good. We'll catch you at the break one. Bye bye. The stern is the hardest part of the ship to maneuver. So that's where Vic wants Mark to attach his tow line. Braking strength on this line is 880,000 pounds. This is what we stop the ship, we pull the ship, we push the ship and all that. Now, Vic is ready to maneuver the big ship. They're entering the basin where they can turn her. Now begins a dangerous dance between ship and tug. Vic's got just 100 feet of elbow room to rotate the ship 220 degrees. On Vic's command, Mark steers to starboard. Let's stop the jackknife the direct pull and make it for you. And the Hanjin Washington's massive stern begins to swing around. You're always on your toes. You're trying to work with the pilot, understand what he's going through. Vic uses a small engine in the bow to help propel the ship around. So I'll go to 45 now. He's almost completed the turn, but the trickiest part still lies ahead. He must guide the ship backwards to parallel park behind another Hanjin Company vessel already tied up. And the stern of that ship is just 100 feet away. The danger involved with this maneuver is when you're looking over the containers out towards the bow, is judging the distance. It's very difficult to do that. He's making judgments based on markings on the dock. Well, we want to try to get the bridge at the 500 foot mark on the dock. So push dead slow, turn to port. Okay, the Captain, in good position. Yeah. Welcome to Long Beach, sir. Okay, okay. have a good day. The job done. <laughs> Everybody's happy, no noise. But one day soon, Vic's job is going to get much harder because the ships are getting bigger. At Denmark's Erdense shipyard, one of the new generation of mega container ships is nearly completed. The Adrian Maersk is 141 feet longer and seven feet deeper than the Hanjin Washington. More important, she can carry an extra 650 containers. Why the urge to build bigger and bigger ships? Simple economics. The more containers a ship can carry, the lower the shipping costs per container. Which is why, in the adjacent dry dock, workers have begun to construct her sister ship. 
This new vessel, she doesn't have a name yet, will be capable of carrying an astounding 3,300 containers. It's going to take workers three more months to finish building her, if they can stay on schedule. The work itself will be extremely difficult, but the process is easy enough to understand. Building a ship is a rather simple process. We just have to bring in some 10, 12,000 steel plates, clean them, and cut them into some 120,000 pieces and weld them together. Step one, steel, lots of it. Enough to cover eight football fields. Machines do a lot of the work here, like moving the plates to the work shed where they ride on rollers to get cleaned. Step two, cut the steel into pre-designed shapes. That's done by computerized cutting torches, each one as hot as a lightning bolt. Two technicians and a remote control do the work of 14 men in a fraction of the time. The torches even work underwater, where the thin steel plates keep cool so the superheat doesn't bend them. Step three, weld steel into sections. An army of robotic welders does most of the straight line welding. But the more intricate work must still be done by hand. These enormous honeycomb-like structures will form the ship's skeleton. Without them, the hull would crumple under the tremendous weight of the containers and the pressure of waves. When all the sections are assembled, this container ship will be the longest in the world. And an enormous challenge to container ports like Long Beach, where the Hanjin Washington has just tied up. Now she's less of a ship and more of a giant warehouse at one end of a huge assembly line. Most of her containers must be offloaded and sent by truck and train to destinations across the country. At the same time, she'll be loaded with new containers destined for other ports. Almost one third of US imports go through the ports of Long Beach and nearby Los Angeles. 11.3 million containers on approximately 8,000 ships every year. You got three, you got three. A delay here can mean hospitals run out of supplies and supermarkets have empty shelves. And will cost the shipping company $7,500 an hour. Even worse, the shipper might lose its customers if it doesn't deliver their cargo on time. So the work goes on around the clock. But first, somebody has to set the whole process in motion. Right now, that somebody is Aaron Pearson, superintendent of the first shift. OK, that's everything? She's got a tremendous task to tackle. Uh, Steve, you copy Steve? I didn't copy that. Where are you? In less than two hours, she has to pull together paperwork for hundreds of containers coming off the ship and going back on. We don't have, okay. Oh, shoot. And assemble a crew of 100 longshoremen and crane operators. Okay, I had four originally. One's going to the other ship and the H's are going to the ground. The big challenge right now, getting everyone out there and started by six o'clock. And then, okay. You wanna have a cup? She makes it. It's Monday at 6 p.m. and night has fallen as she heads out to the ship. The 48-hour countdown has begun. That's how long the Hanjin Company allows for unloading and reloading a vessel the size of the Washington. 
For the ship to leave on time, Aaron's crew will have to move 1,000 containers during their shift. And it's the crane operators who'll be under the greatest pressure. Years ago, cargo came in sacks and crates. Longshoremen carried them on their backs. Today, everything's in containers, and the heavy lifting gets done by state-of-the-art gantry cranes that cost seven million bucks a piece. With their 200-foot-long arms, they can reach across the bows of even the new mega ships. The cranes grab onto containers with hooks that weigh 11 tons. Four latches lock into the container's corners before it's swung high into the sky. Those latches are all that's holding it. We're moving a lot of heavy cargo. Things could fall. As you can see, it's a large operation, so you have to take all the safety precautions necessary. To hit her target, Erin needs her three cranes to each move 30 containers an hour. That's one every two minutes. But tonight, things are falling behind schedule. We got kind of a slow start tonight. Hopefully by the end of the night, we'll be closer to about 28 moves per hour, which would be a decent start for us. And we'll monitor it as we go. As tough as Aaron's job is now, it's only going to get tougher when the mega ships arrive. She'll have to monitor even more cranes and more people. To carry more cargo, the new mega ships will need more power. In Denmark, they're working on the crankshaft for the new ship's diesel engine which will deliver a staggering 93,000 horsepower. Weighing 2,100 tons when fully assembled, it will be the world's largest ship engine. So big, it had to be made in three sections. Today, they're preparing the crankshaft to receive the engine block. The liquid sealant should ensure an airtight fit. They're going to need a powerful crane to do the lifting. Shipbuilder Stefan Rennebaud helps guide the crane operator. Three hundred seventy-five feet up in the crane cabin, operator Keld Matson gets the word to go. Now, the really hard part begins. The two sections have to fit together with the precision of a Swiss watch. Hundreds of pre-drilled bolt holes need to line up perfectly. but the first bolt won't go in all the way. The holes aren't matching up properly. The sections are 15 millimeters out of alignment. They're going to have to try to shift the engine block. We try to move it up again, and then we start from the middle. Go out. We have a little problem on this middle of it. After an hour, they're ready to try again. 
This time, the bolts go through. They have just six more days to install the rest of the engine. Back at the Hanjin, Washington, the longshoremen are racing to meet their deadlines. The container yard is filling up as Jeff O'Donnell, superintendent of the day shift, begins his rounds. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Jeff, on our afternoon, just getting into those... Uh, on a day like today, we've probably got close to 1,000 containers that are going to be going into the yard. As you're putting stuff into the yard, we're also loading containers back, so creating more space. It, it goes hand in hand. It's a big chess game. We've got a lot of players involved with the chess game trying to make it happen, so it gets crazy. On the ship's main deck, Jeff and his ship boss, Eric, go over the day's schedule. Containers must be loaded and unloaded in proper sequence. If too many containers get taken off one side of the ship, she could become unbalanced and even roll over. It's Eric's job to make sure that crane operators get it right. Eli, you wanted to stack a three nine? And that no one gets hurt by flying containers. And 100 ton hatch covers slamming shut. Luckily, he's got one of the best crane operators working the middle crane. James Moses, a 34-year veteran. James makes it look easy to lift a 29-ton container out of the hold, swing it off the ship, and place it on the back of a truck 140 feet below. That's why they pay crane operators the big bucks, up to 200 grand a year. This is my container, and the object of this game is for me to land it, to operate it. It's swinging. If the load is here, I have to come here for it to be stable. If it's over here and I'm back here, it's gonna swing. So we're constantly up here jumping around to get over the load to land. Now let's do it for real. <laughs> James controls the crane with a pair of high-tech joysticks. I drop them all by eye with depth perception and low coordination, a good signal man on the ground. Sometimes we lose them, they fall overboard. And sometimes it can be a million dollars worth of computer parts. You just don't want to do that. frustrated on this equipment, it will whoop you. When the new mega ships come in, James is going to need every bit of his patience and skill. I need an inch. With containers dropping down at 10 feet a second, being a truck driver is a dangerous occupation. It takes a special kind of person to handle these risks. It takes a grandmother. My name is Lata Stukan, and I'm working almost uh, seven, eight years every day in Anjan, and I love it. This is like a, my second family over here. We have sometimes barbecue and we bring homemade cookies and everybody love it. Don't let Zlata's mild manner fool you. This is one hardworking lady. She's got to drive to the storage area 50 yards away. Park in the first available space. Unhook her load. Attach an empty chassis and head
head back into the line as soon as possible. She'll make the same circuit 30 times in her eight hour shift. It'll take a total of 24 trucks, not all of them driven by grandmothers, to unload and reload the Hanjin Washington. All containers come first to the storage yard, which can hold up to 8,000 of them. About half will leave by truck for destinations across America. The other half will go on railroad trains that depart nightly. And right now, Rail Superintendent Tony Castaneda has a big problem. It's going to be a nightmare. Um, I shouldn't be saying that. It's going to be a, a challenge. There aren't enough empty railroad cars to handle all the containers that need to go out on today's trains. We're going to be maybe running an hour, hour and a half behind. Our trends might end up uh, on the short side today because we're not going to be able to load everything that we want to load today. The crew has to stand around doing nothing. We're not getting any production done, so we're losing time, we're losing money, we're falling behind. It just does a snowball effect. This cargo has to move. 530 of these containers came off the hinge in Washington. If they're not on a train by day's end, it will cause a delay all down the line. Finally, an hour later, there's some good okay. news on the phone. Well, it looks like he's got his signal. He's getting ready to pull forward because he's... There we go. Now the pressure is on the yard crew. They've got just six hours, not the regular eight, to load the containers onto the trains. That means it's time for the Rocky Quintana Show. Shoreman since 1998, Rocky needs all her bravado to handle one of the most dangerous jobs on the waterfront. To secure the top containers to the bottom ones, she has to insert a locking mechanism at each corner. We have to go from car to car, jumping up and down on the rails, so you have to be in pretty good shape to do this job. With containers dropping all around her, Rocky is, in effect, playing in traffic. You have to stay focused, because one false move, or if you're preoccupied, that can mean today you're not going to go home. By lunchtime, Rocky and the gang have loaded only half the day's quota. Rail Superintendent Tony Castaneda is worried. And after lunch, we will uh, load, finish loading the rest of this train and load the second train for the Burlington Northern Santa Fe. So we're really up, up against the gun still. Back on board the Hanjin Washington, Superintendent Jeff has his own worries. His crew's been working as fast as safely possible. But with less than 25 hours to go, he's behind schedule. It's uh, right about 5 o'clock right now. It's going to be real rough fish, I'm, I'm thinking right now. It's going to be tight. If he can't figure out a way to get more containers off and on board quicker, his ship may not sail on time. Meanwhile, at the Erdense shipyard, work on the new mega ship has reached a critical stage. They must attach the bulb-shaped structure to the ship's bow, where it will reduce the impact of oncoming waves. Who's the crew that's going to handle all this heavy lifting? 
one man, Stefan Renaud, with a little more help from the big crane. Right now we're gonna lift the section up and uh, turn it uh, 45 degrees and then put it on the on the, the ship. Stefan radios to Kelt high up in the big crane to start lifting. All's going according to plan. Until Stefan notices something wrong. The welders forgot to cut off two extra steel beams. So Stefan has to light up. That's tons of steel dangling over his head. He's got a lot of trust in the crane operator. Now they can swing the wave breaker into place. Yep. And the pieces can finally be welded together. It's the enormous size and scale of these ships that makes them so difficult to build and such a problem for ports like Long Beach. To accommodate the new vessels, it's not enough to just buy some new cranes. The whole harbor is going to need a major makeover to the tune of $2 billion. The Port Authority is extending Pier T by three football fields so that it can provide room for a total of four megaships. And that means a whole lot of work for the dredging crew. We just dig. And that's what we do, and we like it. Dredge foreman Curtis Sands and his crew have to dig up hundreds of thousands of tons of mud and sand to deepen the channel to 55 feet. Otherwise, the mega ships would scrape bottom. When work's done, Pier T will be the first at Long Beach designed for the mega ships. Those ships will send more containers to the rail yard, which already has its hands full. A derailment brings work to a standstill. They changed this wheel, and I don't think they set it down on the track, and so when it pulled on it, it pulled right off the track. They drug it about, I don't know, a thousand yards. Luckily, the engineer was watching his mirror and he saw smoke coming out and he stopped the train. At this point in time, changed the set of wheels and didn't set the wheels back down onto the track. So we've got a derailment. They'll have to lift the derailed car off the track so that the train can get moving again. The delay will cause Tony's crew to fall short of the day's quota of 530 moves. I thought we had salvaged the day. We're only maybe 70 moves short of a regular day. Today's been an excellent day. As a matter of fact, I'm gonna take tomorrow off. Luckily, a short fall this size won't slow down work on the Hange in Washington, where Jeff and his crew are nearing the end of their eight-hour shift. They've managed to offload and reload their quota of containers. If the night crew can just keep up the pace, the Hanjin Washington may sail away tomorrow on time. But that's a big if. Back in Denmark, they're halfway through building the new ship with months of hard labor ahead. 
But 50 yards away, her sister ship, Adrian Maersk, is almost completed. But the key mission of a container ship is to carry cargo. And this morning, shipbuilders Bo Christensen and Lars Conradsen have to conduct a crucial test of the ship's cargo holds. The yellow cage they're riding in is the test device. It's built to the exact dimensions of a standard 40-foot container. The crane operator maneuvers the test cage so it slides into one of the pairs of rails that line the walls of the 77-foot deep cargo hold. The containers can be stacked nine deep. Bowen Lars will check the fit between rails and container. No more than four millimeters clearance on either side, or they'll have to cut off the rails and reposition them, which could delay the completion date. They also measure the distance between the rail and the reference point on the container. Anything between 39 and 27 millimeters is fine. You got the right measurement. If the other cargo holds check out and the rest of the work gets done, the Adrian Maersk can begin her sea trials in just five days. To reach the sea, they'll first have to maneuver the ship out of the tiny harbor, and that's going to be extremely difficult. Back at Long Beach, with time running out, work on the Hanjin Washington has fallen seriously behind schedule. Jeff, the day superintendent, is going to have his hands full trying to finish on time. It's not going good. Last night they had a, a bad night on it. And today, we have a lot of discharge coming off the ship going to wheels, which always is a slower operation, especially when you throw the traffic out in the yard. And we'll be discharging up till probably 1,700 today, 5 o'clock. So and that's on a finish up, that's a little scary because we call them must makes. We have to get the, ca the cargo off the ship and get all the cargo on the ship. So it's, uh, it's, it'll go down to the wire. Out on the dock, Jeff and Eric have come up with a plan. They've asked for more longshoremen and another crane. Now Jeff thinks he'll have a fighting chance to meet the schedule. Back in Denmark, the Adrian Maersk is getting ready to depart for her sea trials. Twenty-year veteran Peter Koch will captain the ship when it reaches the open sea. But it's up to the pilot, Steen Finson, to guide it out of the harbor. Chance here is that there's an enormous, huge ship, and uh, the uh, the way we have to take it out is uh, very bended and it's very narrow, and uh, we have some uh, limitations with the wind and current. The harbor is too shallow to start the propeller, so the ship will be moved out by tugboats. backwards because there isn't enough deep water to turn her around. The first hour passes without incident. 
30 grader styrbord. But the toughest part of the trip lies straight ahead. To reach open water, the pilot will have to slide the mammoth ship through the harbor's narrow entrance. It's about 100 meters wide, and the ship is 43 meters wide. So we will we'll have a, about 20 meters, 30 meters on, on, on the sides. And as if that weren't difficult enough, they'll also have to wait for the tides to be just right. If the current is coming in with a level about one knot, it's almost impossible to get out because it is uh, working against the turn we have to do. Yeah, Finally, the pilot says it's time to go. As the tugs rev up their engines, Captain Koch has his concerns. It'll be nice when, the, when this is over and then can start to breathe more freely. The tugs are doing just three knots. Even sped up 300 times, the enormous ship takes 15 seconds to go by. Eighteen agonizing minutes later, they're only halfway through the gap. Finally, looking back over the ship's bow, the captain can see the harbor recede. They're through. If everything else goes well, the Adrian Maersk will begin calling at container ports around the world in just a few weeks. at Long Beach, it looks like Jeff's luck has finally turned around. It's now uh, 18.30 on Wednesday night, and we're finished. The last couple hours actually went really smooth. Cargo operations done and lashing approved by the chief mate, so we're good to go. That's it. All completed. thousand seven hundred sixty containers moved off and one thousand three hundred and sixty three containers put back on in just 48 and a half hours but the numbers are going to keep growing by the year 2010 most of the container ships calling at Long Beach will be the size of the Adrian Maersk and bigger Ships like the Hanjin Washington will gradually become a thing of the past.